Hey, welcome back to part two of a three-part video series we're calling The Bible Truth, right? This is part two. If you have not watched part one yet, I would strongly encourage you to go back and watch part one, even if possible, before you watch this one. Part one will give you a 30,000-foot aerial flyover, right? It'll give you a little bit of a foundation as to why we believe what we believe and why we trust the Bible to be the Word of God. Part one will give you that foundation. Uh, it'll, it'll give you the foundation for this video, in fact. Um, so, yeah, so I would encourage you to go back and watch it. Hey, if you're here... And, and you're here to watch this one. Listen, I'm excited. Welcome to part two, right? In this video, listen, we're going to do a little closer flying, right? We're going to fly a little closer to the ground. Um, before we're done today, it's my prayer, it's my prayer that you and I will be able to work through and get answers to some of the toughest questions that we hear today, both inside and outside the church, right? Questions like, is the Bible actually the Word of God? Uh, does the Bible actually reveal God to us in the pages of the Bible, right? Is the Bible a trustworthy revelation of God for us today? Um, with so many other religions out there, how do we know what to believe uh, about the Bible? And if so many claim to believe the Bible, why do we not all agree in doctrine and practice? Listen, these are great questions. In this video, we're going to answer these questions and a bunch more. And I want to encourage you, listen, I want to encourage you to watch to the very end of this video, video number two. Again, because at the end, we're going to give some detailed evidence, detailed evidence, nerdy detailed evidence for the support for those answers that we're going to give in this video. It's all here. It's all right now. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. This is Pastor Nate with On Mission Living. Thank you. You have joined us for part two of the three-part series, The Bible Truth. And we appreciate you being here with us. We're just going to dive in. Uh, I want to just share a few highlights. Again, kind of bringing one to two together, video one and video two. One is we're talking about the Holy Scriptures, right? The Bible, the Word of God. The word Bible comes from the Latin and Greek words meaning book, which is appropriate because it represents 66 individual books inspired, we believe inspired by God brought together to reveal God himself to his image-bearing creation, mankind, right? So through all 66 books that have been canonized together forming one book, it contains one solid theme all the way through the book, and that is the hero is God. The hero is God's son, right? The scriptures paint a picture, if you will, a portrait of a, a long history of God uh, interrupting, right? Graciously interrupting man's timeline. And, and in doing so, listen, revealing himself, revealing his nature, revealing his ways, revealing his love for mankind, revealing his plan to restore mankind after the fall. And the beginning, the story goes from one season into the next, and it lists the consistency of God's love for mankind is seen through every page. So you see his nature, his heart, his names, what he's about, what his purpose is, his love for us, his purpose for us, and ultimately all pointing to his son, the culmination of the promises from the front of the book to the back happened in his son. He sent his son, his son pays the debt we can't pay, and as a result, listen, his spirit takes control. After he ascends into heaven, he dies for our sin, takes the wrath of God upon himself in our place. And then from there, the rest of the story unfolds. And, and, and that continues until this very day, right? Post-resurrection is the Holy Spirit, his word, the word, the Holy Spirit illuminating the word, puts it in our hearts, and we live for him, right? We one day will join with him. So the Bible, listen, the Bible, if the Bible's true, Here's where it gets sticky for some. If the Bible's true, then those who refuse it, misuse it, or abuse it, take away from it, or add to it, listen, they're in serious jeopardy, even for the Bible. So if the Bible's true, then that's also true. So the challenge is this, that not all believers, why do not all people who profess to be believers in God, why do they not, even if they believe, they say they believe in the Bible, why do we not all agree in practice and belief and, and interpretation? And I would tell you the reason is this, many hold a very, very, very low view of Scripture. Right? They say they believe it, they hold it, they claim it's one of their inspired works, and they claim it's of God, but then they literally have an incredibly low view of Scripture. It's not, it's not the authority, it's a very, very low position in, their, in what they've accepted as true, as opposed to those like myself and everybody affiliated with On Mission Living, which has a very high view of Scripture, right? Not meaning we're better than anybody, meaning we believe the Word of God is better, right? It is, a, it is from God, it is revealed from God to us, it is inspired by God, for us and ultimately illuminated by God in us. And as a result, listen, that is the last word and authority. I would tell you just as an example, again, I'm disclaimer, right? No, no offense intended in this video, but, but many, many groups out there, including some that I'll name here, Roman Catholics, uh, Anglicans, Eastern Orthodox Christians, and many more, they will tell you that they hold to the Bible. They will tell you that they believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. They will tell you that the Bible is true. And they often tote them, read them, and have them as part of their arsenal. 
Uh, I know there are no doubt dedicated Christians in these groups. My point is this, in their official writings from their denominations or their, their religious organizations, they will tell you that the highest authority in their teaching, the highest authority in their understanding of the truth are not just the Bible, but more in fact, the sacred church traditions of their, of their background, right, their history. And so here's the way they would say it. They would say to be right and to live right, you have to hold to both man-made authored, man-authored traditions, right, the church traditions, and the God-authored scriptures. Um, and then if there's a conflict, and this is what they don't like to talk about, but if there's a conflict in writing, they would tell you and they will teach you that when that's the case, the church now, the new church traditions trump the inspired word of God, which if you say it that way, obviously it becomes like it does. Like, why would anybody say that? But that is exactly what they teach. So they would tell you the word of God is the truth unless it contradicts with the church traditions, the modern day church traditions or historical church traditions, in which case the church traditions trump the word of God. Now, I would tell you that's a very, very, very low view of Scripture. Uh, unfortunately, in the Bible itself would reference that as idolatry, right? It would reference that as idolatry. We hold to what is known through the Protestant Reformation movement as sola scriptura, right? There's, I'll do another video down the road that will be specifically about this. But it's basically, without giving any of the history, it's basically the understanding and the teaching that the Word of God, the Bible, is the last word and testament and the last authority, the final highest authority, right? for all things truth and practice for God's people. Right? I hope that makes just as clear sense as I can possibly say. It is the final authority is the word of God, right? Not my understanding, but the word of God. In the past 2000 years, Paul referenced it, Jesus referenced it. There have been many who have a very, very low view of scripture. They will come in as wolves in sheep's clothing, as Jesus says, uh, and, and literally to deceive, and they will take from, they will add to uh, their thoughts, their ideas, their their understandings that, again, are totally not in context with the Word of God, yet they will teach it like it's true. Um, I would tell you that this, so we can remember it, right, so in the future you can look for it, I would call this a buffet Bible view, right, a buffet Bible view, meaning that meaning that they're looking at it like a buffet, right? If you've ever been to a buffet, you know, you, you can pick and choose what you want to put on your plate, right? I, I love that, meat and potatoes, I love that. Ooh, that's okra, I happen to love okra. But if I, there's okra, I don't care for okra. Ooh, there's green beans, I don't want green beans. Ooh, you know, I definitely want dessert. So a, a buffet Bible view, right? It would be taking the Bible for what we want, not for what the Bible says. I hope that makes sense. That's been going on since Jesus' day, right? Paul warned about it, Jesus warned about it. In addition to that, what I would say today we deal with in a big way in our culture today, and they dealt with them, which is also a wolf in sheep's clothing, and that is what we call continued revelation, right? Continued revelation, meaning that the, that that was inspired by the apostles, that that was inspired by Jesus himself, that that was inspired to the prophets, and we're gonna read some scriptures here in a minute that will say God spoke to the man through, to man through the prophets, and now he speaks through Christ. All these that were eyewitness of Christ, learned from Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote it, and that's it, right? We have the 66 books. I would tell you, listen, continued revelation is man's idea in our day or any time in the recent history to say that, that God now has a new revelation and he gave it to them, right? One person, typically unvalidated, typically unsupported with truth at any, at any level, and they would tell you that they had a dream or they had a vision or they got it on gold tablets or they got it on something. And that new doctrine, that continued revelation, God inspired all that, that's great, but now he's given me a new revelation. And that new revelation is the final authority over the word of God. And if there's a contradiction, just like the sacred traditions of some, then it's still the new revelation trumps the old, right? So God was either mistaken or wrong or lying. And now it's this, right? It's changed. And that's what we call a continued revelation. Very, very dangerous doctrine. Examples of these have started what I would call the occult or cultish movements. Um, many, many examples out there. So just to reel off a few, Joseph Smith, um, you know, with the Mormon group, Charles Russell, with Jehovah's Witness, Ellen G. White, uh, Muhammad, uh, Bill Johnson, Garner Ted Armstrong, Mary Baker Eddy, Rick Joyner, and there are just countless others who have all claimed their own apostolic revelation from God. And yes, it does contradict, and all those I named and many others, it often contradicts the word of God. And when it does, listen, that's how you know it's a false doctrine, right? God is not doing a new revelation to Bill Johnson, right? I don't care what Bill says. At the end of the day, the word of God is what we have is the true due north. It is the inspired true word of God that's been authenticated, verified, validated, substantiated, and referenced. And listen, all of the new stuff that's out there right now, every bit of it, I would tell you that when it contradicts the word of God, listen, the one true we have, absolutely, is the Holy Spirit inspired word of God that we have. 
And to, to add to it or to take away from it, the Bible speaks to that, right? It's very, very dangerous. Jesus says in Matthew 7, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, meaning they look good, they look like sheep, they look like they're part of, of the kingdom, but they're not, right? But inwardly, it says they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits, our grapes gathered from thorn bushes, our figs th from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. You say, wait a minute, but these guys have big audiences. They have fancy clothes. They have jets. They've been very blessed. I would tell you, bad fruit, listen, is any fruit of, of something or someone, listen, other than Jesus. If the credit and the glory is going to someone other than Jesus, it's not good fruit. If it contradicts Jesus' words and Jesus' word that he's already authenticated, it's not good fruit, right? And, and it just goes on and on. This is bad fruit and our cult, our, our our culture is full of it, right? Cults, listen, cult, cults and the occult are notorious, notorious for having extra outside, right? Extra biblical revelation and the denial of the sole authority of scripture, right? I say again, extra biblical revelation and the denial of sole authority of scripture. This is the common ground, the common denominator for cults all across the land. And that was that way in Jesus' day, it was that way in Paul's day, and it's that way in our day. So we get asked all the time, how do we know, right? How do we know that all roads don't lead to heaven? The Bible doesn't leave room for that. So if the Bible is true or the Bible's not. If the Bible is, and I'm gonna explain at the end of this video how we know it is, how it is the reveal of God, if it is true, then the Bible leaves no room for all roads lead to heaven, right? No matter what the doctrine is or how sweet the, the teaching might sound. Um, all dogs don't go to heaven, right? That's a Disney movie. It doesn't line up with scripture. Say dogs go to heaven, right? That's the way this works. So that's it. We're going to deal with three right quick. There's so many out there, but I just want to really kind of zone in for just a second and give you a, a good good look at what it is to have a high view of scripture versus low with maybe some some uh, some beliefs out there, some religious beliefs that you are, are semi-familiar with or you've heard online or heard, heard around you. And I just, again, I want to tell you, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm not trying to, to push anybody down a, down a cliff or hurt anybody's feelings. I'm trying to help us. This is about the Bible. This is why we believe what we believe about the Bible. And I want to give you three quick examples, just some highlights of at least three in our culture that are predominant and I would tell you again, they have a very low view of Scripture. And because of that, they have been swayed by revelation that's not of God. Amen? Here we go. I'm going to dive into three, right? Just three of the false doctrines that are out there. Uh, again, this is not to put people down or to, to elevate us, but to literally elevate the Word of God, right? We have a high view of Scripture. We hold to a high view of Scripture. And, and that's what distinguishes us as Christian, genuine Bible-believing Christians in the world we live in, right? So just three really, I mean, there's many, many, many doctrines out there and beliefs out there, and we're not going to get into all of them today. And even these will just be an aerial view, right? Just an aerial view of these three. But I want to kind of explain to you why, and hopefully before we're done, you'll be able to see a comparison of what a low view of Scripture is versus a high view of Scripture, and that's my purpose in this. So the first group that we're going to talk about is the Mormons, right? The, the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're formerly called uh, LDS, or Latter-day Saints, uh, by most uh, again, just real, real quick, right? The Mormons consider the Bible one of their holy scriptures, right? They will tell you, oh, we also believe that, but they do not believe in Bible inerrancy. They believe that the Bible is accurate to the extent that it was it was correct. Uh, and where they differ with their other literature, then their new literature is the new revelation, and it trumps that, right? It trumps the Word of God. Uh, we'll get into that real quick. Joseph Smith was the founder of the LDS Church, uh, early 1800s, roughly, so it's all been in the last 250 years. Uh, founder, originator, testimony of one. Key point there, right? Testimony of one. One man, historically, take everything else away and the biases, right? You look the man up, Joseph Smith in the 1800s, you will see he was not a trusted man in his day. He was uh, regarded as, a, as a, a liar. He was regarded as a man on the run from the law. Uh, a person who had no regard for authority, a lot of other things. But nonetheless, this man in the 1800s, Joseph Smith, uh, alleged that an angel of God had given him a New Testament, right? A, not the New Testament, but a new revelation from God. And, and that new revelation trumped the old, and it made the corrections as necessary, right? Like the, like the Bible we had, had had stuff somewhere along history removed or left out or, or erred in along translation. So, so Joseph Smith comes along, and he starts what we now know as the Mormon faith or doctrine. Again, here's, here's the essence of it, right? One testimony, one man. Um, in the origins... Uh, you look this up historically, there were a couple of men that stepped up and said they also saw. Joseph Smith said an angel of the Lord put two golden tablets below a rock and said, there it is, find it there, that's my word, my new revelation. Joseph Smith allegedly moved the rock, found the two tablets golden. Uh, two men stepped up in, in time and said, hey, we were there, we saw the golden tablets. They later were, were questioned and denied that they'd ever seen the golden tablets. They admitted that they had lied for Joseph Smith and that they had no recollection they'd never seen any golden tablets or anything even similar. 
Uh, so his two testimonies were debunked and cast aside, leaving back to just one. And then it came down to, well, then let's see the golden tablets. And then history would tell you his story claim that although he had it up here because he'd read it uh, and he had it in his heart, uh, but in fact, there was no golden tablets. And allegedly he made the claim that maybe the angel of the Lord that brought it took it back home. So it was nowhere to be found. So you've got an entire movement, an entire new faith, a new doctrine, a correction of all of the Bibles we had it over spanning over 1500 years. All of that was literally questioned then and, and an overriding authority was given to Joseph Smith. One man with one testimony, no support historically or otherwise. Um, so that's basically the the start, if you will, of the, and there's lots more to it, but that's basically the start. Now here's, real quick, is I'm gonna try to do this fast. The, the doctrinal differences, the high view versus low view or no view of scripture, right? Holding, holding the scripture as the truth or not. They would tell you, if you ask them, oh no, we believe that. But then they would also turn around and tell you that they believe there's a lot missing. There's a lot of stuff that was, it, it was in error. And the new things that Joseph Smith had and was revealed to him out in the desert trumped it all. So. Kind of hold on to that Bible, say you believe it, but at the same time, these other books that have now been written are going to be the ones that correct that, and that's all per God, allegedly. Number one, just three or four, and there's tons, but let's just go with three or four. Number one is they believe, and Joseph Smith taught that God, the Father, has a physical form just like you and me, right? Flesh and bones. In fact, he, he's not spirit, as the Bible says, but in fact, he said, an exalted man, God is an exalted man with a physical body of flesh and bone, right? Flesh and bone. Now we know from John 4.24 and other texts, but from John 4.24 in the Bible, that a God is spirit. He is spirit. God the Father in heaven is spirit and will be worshiped. Uh, those who want to worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We know that from the Bible. Number two, number two in the Mormon faith, the questionable things that again, low view of scripture says he taught that there was no and is no original sin inherited by us all, right? He taught that there was no original sin in the garden, even though Genesis clearly lays that out. Um, and we know from Romans 5.12, not just the original story that Joseph Smith tried to debunk or, or defuse or, or discredit. We know from Romans 5.12 that it says when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, right? Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned, right? So again, Joseph Smith, low view of scripture, decides to make his own, right? Make his own up and, and comes up with a, a doctrine, a teaching that says there was no original sin regardless of what God inspired through Moses. Uh, number three, right? Number three, the teach, they teach that Jesus was not the only begotten Son of God, but was only the firstborn Son of God in the what they call the pre-existence, right? The pre-existence. And they would tell you that all of us, you, me, every breathing human being here ever, are all his brothers or sisters from before time, right? In spirit, we were already there. In fact, they teach that all people are the pre-existed pre-existent spiritual offspring of the Heavenly Father and Mother. That's what they teach. Uh, in fact, in fact, I'll quote from there, it says, all men and women are literally the sons and daughters of deity. They teach that we are all gods in embryo form. We are all gods in embryo form, making all of us literally equal with Jesus, okay? From before creation. Yeah, I know, from before creation. And I quote, this is out of their book, right? As man is, God once was. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. All right? So we earn our way to this, to be gods, because we're already gods, just in embryo form, right? Again, incredible low view of scripture. I hope you see exactly, when you're listening to this, I trust this is registering in your heart right now, like what in the world? Not just because you haven't heard it, but because it doesn't line up with scripture. It doesn't line up with the Bible, right? So what do we know from the Bible? We know the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the virgin born God incarnate, right? In the flesh who existed in, for all time with the Father and the Holy Spirit as a trinity. The Mormons do not believe that. Uh, we believe that um, Jesus possessed, he was all God and all man. Uh, and, and, and that makes him the only one that could pay for our sins, right? Um, again, all kinds of references. John 1, uh, John 8, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 13. Um, Here's another for you that would mess up their doctrine all by itself. This is Isaiah 55, 8, 9. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Uh, and and for my, thoughts, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen, outside of Christ, there is nothing divine or holy about us. That's Bible, right? We were enemies of God to begin with, outside of Christ laying his life down for us and us accepting him. Listen, there is nothing in the Bible that supports that we were all there as 
children of mother and father God somewhere pre-existent, right? This is completely a fallacy. Again, because it absolutely doesn't line up with Scripture. There is no support for it. There's no testimonies for it. It's all the testimony of one crazed man who even in his day was not respected in any way or measure, right? That's the Mormon church. Number four and last of this is the LDS church subscribes to the doctrine that is the, one of the most dangerous today across the board, and that is continual revelation. Continual revelation, which means the Mormons believe, as do many other cult groups out there, that apostolic, rev, apostolic revelation is inspired but not infallible and can even today supersede previous revelation, including that that is found in Scripture, right? Here, here's the long and short of it. They believe with all their heart and they teach it with conviction that new revelation that can happen right here, right now to you, in me, or to you, uh, or what they would say comes to them, trumps even the Bible. So even though the Bible has eyewitness accounts and testimonies galore and, and substantiated over 1,500 years of span, even though that's been testified to and has external proofs and historical references like crazy, it's all substantiated from front to back, all of that being true and accurate to 100%, a new revelation given to a new leader in the Mormon church can absolutely authoritatively trump that truth, right? That's what the Mormon doctrine believes. That's what it believes. In fact, if you look it up and you ask them, it'll tell you the one, they believe the one authorized to bring forth new doctrine today has to be whoever's in the current active role of president of the Mormon church, much like the Catholics with the Pope, right? The, the president of the Mormon church can can lay out a new doctrine, a new teaching, and if it contradicts the Word of God, we are to push aside the Word of God, low view of Scripture, hold tight to what He said God has revealed to Him in this day and age. And I will tell you that, again, they're not the only ones, right? We've got people alleging that they're Christian of the Christian faith. We've got people leading people astray by the thousands today, right? All claiming a new age of apostolic teachings that are, that are fresh, that are brand new, and different than the Word of God. So trust us, not the, not the proven authoritative word of God. Very, very dangerous doctrine. Real quick in closing out the Mormon side of this, Revelations 22, 18 and 19 says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, God will take away his part, listen, from the tree of life, from the holy city, which are written in this book. It is incredibly dangerous to take from and add to, and that is exactly what the Mormons have done since their origin, right? Proverbs 30 and 6 is do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. I've established just in a glance, just in a drive-by, that what they teach is absolutely not true at all. And lastly, the word of God, the Bible, right, is unique, revealed, inspired, proven, established and verified. And even in its own scriptures, right? 2 Timothy 3.15 says they are all inspired by God. 2 Peter 1 says it's not what they didn't give what they gave on their own that was inspired by the Spirit of God, right? I hope that makes sense. So that's the Muslims. We're going to call out a second one, three of them in this video. Islam, right? Muslim, the Muslim faith, widespread around the world. Again, writings, listen, writings and records of one, not substantiated by tons of other people, even though they got lots of followers today. The whole origin of their religious faith started with the testimony of one, just one, right? One place, one guy, one print, right, in history, 600 years after Jesus, right? Allegedly, again, a new and improved revelation from God. Coincidentally, right? Um, so here it is, that, right? New truth about Jesus, a new truth about God himself, a new truth about his character, what God actually wanted for mankind, and it's all given to Muhammad, right? Allegedly. So here's some quick quick truths about this that we have issue with because, again, low view of Scripture, high view of themselves. Uh, number one, Muhammad says Jesus did not die and raise from the grave. Thus, thus, Jesus was not God the Son and thereby not the savior of mankind, right? Again, you start, you talk to the Muslims, they'll tell you that there's a high esteem for Jesus in the, in the Quran. And I would tell you that it references it with some reverence throughout, but it contradicts itself over and over and over, right? And we'll get into that later, we'll, we'll do a video on it. Number two is Islam has traditionally denied the doctrines of the incarnation, meaning it wasn't God the Son, and they denied the Trinity. They deny the Trinity completely, because again, they will even reference at different points in the Quran that Jesus is the Messiah, son of Mary, messenger, a great prophet, a servant, right? The word even, I think at one point, uh, the spirit of God. Listen, but the Quran omits Jesus' teachings and it rejects that Jesus was and is divine, right? That he is God, period. Uh, the Quran explicitly denies that Jesus to be, is ever to be identified with God. And in fact, to, it, it explicitly refuses to reference Jesus as the son of God. In fact, that's offensive to Muslims in general, right? So just recognize that, so that's number two. Number three, quickly, Muslims deny 
and reject the idea of Jesus, that Jesus was crucified on the cross at all. And again, this starts getting really edgy because people are like, don't all roads lead to heaven? Don't all dogs get to heaven? Listen, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's only one way to heaven, and that's the only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus, right? This, this is a Muslim teaching through the Quran is that Jesus did not and was not crucified on the cross. Listen, friend, no cross, no salvation, right? If it wasn't true and the Bible's in error, then we don't have salvation. So for sure, when they say that he was not crucified, they said the Jews wanted to kill him, but they didn't. It was all just an error, even though we've got all these eyewitnesses and historians from all different walks, not just Jews, even though it's been substantiated in the Muslim faith, the Quran says, no, he wasn't, he didn't die. Not only did he not die for your sins, he wasn't even crucified, right? So again, that's number three. And lastly, number four, and this hopefully will help you, right? Number four is that sin isn't a matter of total depravity, right? Like the Bible says, of human nature. It's more a weakness in human nature, right? It's like a defect or a flaw uh, in our human character. Listen, that can be worked out with serious prayer and disciplines per the Quran, right? So again, you earn your way to heaven, just in essence like the Mormons and just like the last one we're going to cover. You earn your way, and it's not based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is totally denied in the Quran, right? Incredible low view of Scripture. Again, the two clash, just like Mormon faith, right? They're, you're like, well, aren't they Christian? Aren't we? No, not according to the Bible, right? I'm not their judge, but not according to the Bible. If the Bible's true, they're not, okay? Lastly, the third one, and again, we can go on for days. So there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, the Hindu, right? The Hindu faith, uh, stemming from India and places on the, in the East. Uh, a, a mix of, we won't get into it in this video, but a mix of pantheism and polytheism and Anyway, a lot of different uh, backgrounds. This is an old, old religion, but here's, here's kind of the bullet points for this one, right? God is not personal. That's the Hindu, Hindu faith, right? The Hindu religion. God is not a personal. It teaches the, Hinduism teaches that God is, is, is ultimately an impersonal, eternal force, an essence, a, a power of existence, having none of the attributes or characteristics of a person, meaning that this God, this this essence, this power doesn't know or think or love, right? That's the, that's the deal. This force they call Brahman, and it, they claim, they teach that it's present everywhere, listen, and in everything in nature. So God is not just one, it's everywhere and in everything, in particular, everything with life in it, right? Especially all living things, plants, uh, animals, uh, and, and absolutely in every human being, right? That's So God is in, anyway, you get the idea. Um, so it's a spiritual force, but not with personal qualities. Number two, listen, based on that, we have, we are, in essence, the essence within you and I is deity, right? We are gods, big or little g, you decide, right? Um, the, this, this impersonal essence, it pervades everything, right? And it's found within us. So the spirit of this divine nature, if you will, is also in us. So we are all, you and I, per their doctrine, are all the same. We're all got God in us, right? Again, this concept is super popular right now. It's what we commonly refer out there as the mysticism and the New Age movement, and it's in a lot of Hollywood movies and Disney movies, and it's everywhere you look, right? It's, it's this idea that there's this good in you uh, without God, the God, and it's more like we're all gods, right? So if we, again, low view of scripture, lower God down to us, we're all kind of the same. It makes me feel better, and I don't have to work or even look to a God to save me because we're all just basically okay. Uh, this is the Hindu faith, right? These concepts, again, very popular. Uh, I would tell you the Bible teaches completely opposite to that. The Bible, and I can just give you references all day, and if you know anything about the Bible, you know that's true. The Bible says God is a spirit, not flesh and blood. The Bible says he's living, he's loving. Uh, John 5, John 3, he speaks. Matthew 3, he's at work. John 5, he knows, right? He, God knows. Matthew 6, he has a will and a purpose and a, and a plan. In Matthew 7, he sees. All these are characteristics that the Muslim, or the, the Hindu faith rather would suggest this God, this presence does not have, right? So number three, they claim there are many gods, obviously because God's in everything. Uh, they claim, but I would tell you the Bible says there's only one true and living God, and it's not the tree next door, and it's not you and me, right? So John 17, right? Three separate beings, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all completely united as to form one God, right? The triune God. Um, so just a few verses to kind of staple that, right? Deuteronomy 4, 35 to 39, the Lord is God, there's no one else beside him, right? Isaiah 43, 10 and 11, before me there was no God formed, uh, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior, right? There is no other but God. Exodus 20 and 3, you shall have no other gods before me. It doesn't sound like an impersonal absentee God, right? 
Number four, and lastly, right, uh, they worship idols because God's in everything, right? God's in everything in their view and their teaching. So again, we have clear biblical understanding that God knew that kind of stuff existed and it was wrong from the beginning. It says in Exodus 20, you shall not make any graven image or bow down to such. Second Corinthians 6 says Christians should have no agreement with idolatry but should separate ourselves from it. Listen, real quick on the Hindu faith, three, three points here of their you know, intricacies of their doctrine that I, the Bible just absolutely condemns. One is they believe in reincarnation, which means you don't die and, and where the Bible says the opposite, right? It's pointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. They believe in reincarnation, meaning that in this life, when you die, you come back as someone else or something else, right? Here's what they say from, from their stuff is that Hindus believe that the soul reincarnates evolving through many births until all karmas have been resolved uh, and then liberation from the cycle of rebirth is attained. Right? And it says, not a single soul will be deprived of this destiny. So basically all dogs get to heaven ultimately. But it may take you a few lifetimes to get there. So you might come back as a toad, you might come back as a, a lady or a man, or, right? Whatever, and whatever you've done and whatever you're doing and putting up with right now is a product of what you've done in the past. The Bible leaves no room for this, right? Karma is what is the centerpiece of that. It's what you get, you get what you deserve or you're getting what you did before. It says Hindus believe that one, one circumstance in life is completely determined by his previous conduct either in this life or in a previous life, right? Again, all stemming back to reincarnation. And lastly, liberation. That state, according to their doctrine, the state of experiencing God realization. Again, finally getting there, right? This experiential uh, utopia, if you will, right? So their idea of heaven, I suppose. Uh, Hindus explain that the soul reincarnates until karmas are resolved and God realization is attained. So you keep getting good until you get good enough. And then you become God on your own, right? Mystical religion, absolutely the, the, the pinnacle of consciousness where man and God are forever one, right? That's their, that's their jargon. Again, Bible teaches different. The Bible teaches in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed to a man who wants to die. Uh, and then the judgment, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, at death, the body retain, returns to dust and the spirit returns to God who gave it, right? Not to another body. Uh, Luke 16 says when, when one has died, his destiny is fixed. He cannot pass from a destiny to suffering, uh, from of suffering to one of bliss, nor vice versa. Right? Um, this man, resurrection, same thing. We <laughs> we don't teach reincarnation. The Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. The Bible teaches resurrection. Amen. John five says all the all all in the tombs will come forth to the resurrection of life or damnation, rather than reincarnation. That part's not in the Bible, right? Uh, clearly, the Bible teaches resurrection, not reincarnation. Uh, and then lastly, judgment, right? It's pointed to men wants to die. After that, the judgment. So not another chance. Not, don't come back as a frog or as a plant, right? So anyway, so here's the deal. Real, in closing on these three, just three. There's many, many more. But just those three to give you an idea of low view, high view of Scripture, right? Again, the Mormons, the Muslims, and the Hindu, listen, they offered no objective evidence whatsoever that its teachings were ever actually revealed by God, right? The claims are made, but there's no objective evidence whatsoever. Uh, there's no evidence that the scriptures are truly divine in their origin. Listen, there's no eyewitness corroborating witnesses or testimonies. There's no external historical evidences whatsoever. Just one testimony, one guy, no support, no collaboration. I will tell you, when you create yourself as a God or you create yourself as an apostle with a new revelation, making, making God's truth that's already established and verified a lie, you put yourself in a real unique, dangerous position, right? And that's what happens with these false doctrines. They start out claiming that they have heard from God and that now God has changed his mind. That what God said before may or may not have been true. This is now true. And, and man, the Bible speaks of that really clearly, right? That is just incredibly dangerous. So only the Bible, listen, only the Bible offers consistent, reasonable evidence to convince the unbeliever or the believer alike that it is truly revealed by God, right? The evidence is found, listen, in fulfilled, countless fulfilled prophecies, right? Eyewitness testimonies that have been recorded for all eternity, uh, eyewitnesses to miracles from the front of the book to the back, all per God, all documented. No way, no way, no source outside of God could do it. And then ultimately, listen, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, witnessed by hundreds, by hundreds that recorded it. And again, the testimonies of it were recorded and in print and making copies while there were still people alive that were there, right? If it was not true, there would have been tons of documentation and tons of ridicule. It would have squashed it before it ever got started and ever came out of the box. Right? It is just incredibly, incredibly powerful. Only in Christ, only in his word, can we find the assurance for our faith and our salvation. I hope, hope that makes sense. Again, most importantly, low view, high view of scripture, right? Why do we trust the Bible? 
because the Bible's been verified, the Bible's been established, it's revealing God to us, it's inspired, and it's illuminated. So all of the three I covered and, and many, many, many more around us, listen, have an incredibly low view of Scripture. And I hope that's helpful to you. That way, when you begin to hear things that, that contradicts the Word of God, or you begin to hear things about a new revelation from a new insight, from a new, new set of golden tablets or a new dream, listen, be very, very careful that they are not wolves in sheep's clothing, right? Listen, it goes like this. The, they have a low view of Scripture, but we hold to and teach, and the Bible teaches a high view of Scripture, right? No uh, it is inspired of God, it is, it is the revelation of God, and if you'll pay attention and your heart's right with God, he'll illuminate the Word of God for you, right? So you can begin to know him personally through his Word, through his reveal. Uh, there's never been, this is what we're going to get to, the, we're going to turn the corner right now, there's never been a single work of all of antiquity, right? Antiquity meaning the, the ages, right? Everything we have ever found, ever, ever preserved, ever discovered, there's never been a single work, not one that has passed the, the ultimate vetting, if you will, of the highest levels of, of what it takes to be authentic, what it takes to be proven valid, what it takes to be proven uh, uh, characteristically uh, substantiated from every angle, right? They have super high tests for antiquities, so you know it's not just some fake or some fraud or something of no value. Uh, they can date it, they can take it all the way back, and of all those vettings and all those tests, listen, there's never been a book like the Bible. There's never been a, a document like that that made up the Bible. It stands all by itself, right? All by itself. Countless, countless non-believers throughout history, even today in our culture, claim, even though they have no faith in it in themselves, they don't trust the Bible as the truth. Listen, they would acknowledge and substantiate that it has passed all these tests with a higher degree by far than any other book of antiquity out there. They acknowledge, listen, that the Bible stands all alone all alone throughout all of history with irrefutable evidence of accuracy. This is all true, right? You can look this up, you can back this up, you can research this yourself. So three definitive words, and we're gonna cover just one of them in the rest of this video. The other two will be in part three, the next video after this. The first of these three words that define why we trust the Bible, the support for the Bible. One is revelation, right? We've, we've kind of already begun to open that door. The revelation is God revealed. We believe the Bible is God revealed himself, his nature, his character, his laws, his ways, his heart. Uh, his son, right? All revealing God to his image bearing creation. So revelation. The second is inspiration, right? We believe in the Bible teaches. So again, if it's true, if it's really the reveal of God, it says it has been inspired by the Holy Spirit of God front to back, right? And it says all, all of it has been given by God, inspired by God. So revelation, inspiration, and then ultimately illumination, which means that his spirit, the same one that would author it, listen, is the same one that would bring the words off the pages and into our hearts as his people. Once we, by faith, place our faith and trust in Christ, he illuminates the word of God to the point that you, like I said, you have to have help to miss it, right? So it's really super powerful. Those three things, hands down, verify and support why we trust the Bible as the inerrant word of God, why we know it's the reveal of God, why we know it is inspired by God and ultimately illuminated in our lives by God himself, right? So Revelation, we're gonna talk real quick about this. Uh, John 17, right, six through eight. We're gonna just a few scriptures. There's so many, but we'll just cover a few. John 17, six through eight says, I have revealed to you the ones you gave me from this world. Jesus talking to his father. They, they were always yours. You gave them to me and they kept your word. There it is. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you for I have passed on to them the message you gave me, right? So again, his spoken word, his teachings. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. Same chapter, just a little further down for the sake of time, 14 through 18 says, I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, uh, to this world or to the world. Just as I don't belong to the world, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. And listen, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Okay, this is Jesus. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah says in Isaiah 52, he says, but I will, God speaking through Isaiah, says, I will reveal my name to my people. They will come to know its power, the power of his name, right? Then at last they will recognize that I am the one who speaks to them. This is again, God revealing himself, revealing who he is, his name, his character, revealing it to his people. Ezekiel, also Old Testament. Ezekiel 38 says, in this way, I will show my greatness and holiness. This is God revealing, right? His greatness and his holiness. And I will make myself known to all the nations of the world. They will know that I am the Lord. Again, lining up with what we've been talking about this whole time, right? The reveal of God to his image bearing creation. 
Last on this, and again, there's many more, but just to sew it up here. Hebrews 1 says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Again, God speaks. This is New Testament referencing the Old Testament. God spoke, right, through the prophets. And now in these final days, it says, He has spoken to us through His Son, which is Jesus, right? God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. So again, the writer of Hebrews bringing it all together, saying, listen, the Old Testament prophets, they were inspired by God. God spoke to us through them. Now we have the ultimate revelation of God Himself through Jesus, right? The visible image of the invisible God. I hope, I hope that makes sense. So we're just going to dive in. We're going to go into the deep end here, right? Four proofs, and we're going to wrap this video up. Four proofs that are now, I promise you from the beginning, this is a little bit deeper. So here we go. Proofs of revelation authenticity, right? Number one proof, number one, external evidence, right? External evidence that says the Bible is historical and accurate, right? Historical and accurate. I want to just, just hit this go almost in a, in a pace, whipping by here, right? Homer's Iliad, right? Homer's Iliad, the most world-renowned, probably ancient work of the antiquities, right? The most famous ancient Greece authored book has 643 copies, right? 643 known copies of this particular work. Listen, it's one of the most accepted, recognized, taught, well-known. Uh, second, listen, it, close second might be Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, right? And listen, it doesn't have 643 copies. It has 10, 10, right? Just 10 original copies of the earliest copies found. And here's what's a kicker for this, so you can kind of get the picture of where we're going. Of, of Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, the nearest copy we found that they've ever found, right, was, was dated over a thousand years from when the event actually took place. So the, the event took place a thousand years later, we found the first, the, as of today, we have the closest copy to the actual event, which is a thousand years roughly, right? The New Testament, here's kind of brings it into focus of what we're talking about. The New Testament alone has 5,366 known found manuscript copies, right? And it grows. The more archeological digs they do, the more they find. 5,366, again, man, all aligned, right? Listen, most of them, this is so powerful, most of them dated to the second century, some of them the third, right? Second, third century. So literally, it happened and within a hundred years in most cases, right? Of these of these ancient manuscripts, these of, of these ancients. This is incredible. Within nothing compares. Nothing, right? All of the secular world out there, they, they're teaching it in colleges and universities and they're saying we know it's true because a thousand, only only a thousand years after it happened, we have this accurate account of what, what history says, right? The New Testament, listen, we've got authors and, and dated manuscripts, first of all, many, many, many times more, all duplicated exactly, and then it comes back to when was it written? And a chunk of them were written within 100 years of the event. Listen, there were still people around to contradict it, all right? There were still people that knew Jesus, that saw him die, that saw him raise, that by the time these first transcripts were being, were being penned, there were still people close enough that if it was contradictory, if it was something that wasn't true, they would have still been some of them alive. The old, perhaps, but still alive to be able to refute it. And it never happened, right? I'm telling you, this is, this is good. And this is why, again, we know the trustworthiness and even the authenticity is just off the chain. The Apostle Paul says this about the Jewish reproduction, right? The Jewish responsibility of the word. He says, what's the advantage of being a Jew? He says, is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Again, referencing being Jewish. He says, yes, there's great benefits. First of all, he says, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. The whole revelation of God was per his set-aside people, which were the Jewish people, right? And again, when you get into, man, research this yourself, you find out that there has never been a people, even Rome, couldn't touch the accuracy and the just the conviction that, that through the centuries the Jewish people have had. So again, I just want to make clear, listen, and I challenge you to, to, to research for yourself, right? There, to my knowledge, and this is the truth, uh, after a lot of research, I don't know of any ec antiquities expert, right? Nobody that studies legitimately and is renowned as an expert in antiquities or the, the research of, of, of old, old documents, right? The ancients. None of them, listen, none of them question the validity of the New Testament. They don't, that doesn't make them all believers. It doesn't mean they all believe what they know to be absolutely validated, but they absolutely have no question about it because of the length of time from when it actually took place to the, when it actually was recorded the first time and copies began to be made, right? And the meticulous level of which they are copied. And again, they, all of this historical support from all the experts today, it comes from linguistics, it comes from geography, it comes from archeological digs, uh, it comes from, from uh, literally finding over the, over the centuries the objects like pottery and coins and the remains of buildings and remains of, of scrolls. Uh, forensic evidence even is in, involved now, taking this thing to a whole nother level. Listen, millions and millions of man hours have been put into research 
and evidence analysis, archaeological finds and digs, repeatedly, all of them repeatedly confirm and affirm the reliability of the Bible, right? The reliability of the Bible. So the question always comes up, how do we know, right? What about copy accuracy? Yeah, well, it's been copied, and yeah, the Jewish people had this renowned understanding, and it was, it was an issue of conviction from as far back as anybody can trace. They were literally meticulous at their understanding. How about the copy accuracy, though, right? And I just want to put some light on that right now, right? I just want to kind of give you a, a quick, quick rundown on the, why we know the copies are so accurately put together, right? Again, like no other work in the history of the world. Uh, number one, again, as we already covered, the not the original, but the original copies from, from as close as to literally within 100 years of the actual event. Nothing else in history is that close, right? Nothing. So that's a big deal. From the time that the first pen scrolls have been found to the invention of the printing press in the 15th century, all copies were hand copied, right? Hand copied by scribes, right? Uh, again, you say, well, man, that, that gives a whole bunch of room for error. In ancient Israel, listen, in ancient Israel, copies of Scripture were actively used for teaching, reading, and studying actively on a regular basis, which, which meant, and they understood that too, that it was they were exposed to wearing out, they were exposed to use, and they had a set policy, a set understanding in the Jewish ranks and the Jewish scribes that after a certain age, no matter how what the condition of the scrolls, right, and at a certain age, they were all buried. Right? They would literally be buried because now they have to work off the fresher, newer copies because of that very thing. The risk that one, one notation could be from wear, from use, and they didn't want there to be one error. Right, So that's one thing. The other is, that historically, listen, historically, it, this is undisputed. Copying, meticulous copying and passing on the text of the Old Testament uh, became a way of life for the scribes and to those commissioned to copy the scriptures. It was so much more than ceremonial. It was done with the strictest of rules in place. And again, this is well-documented historically, right? We know this. The sheer volume of the earliest copies, this is exciting, right? Made cross-referencing available and possible so that accuracy was guaranteed by the frequent comparisons of these, of these scrolls, right? So you had so many copies that were 100% accurately put together that, that you would have, as you were making your next copy, you had someone else holding the exact same copy of one done the week or two or a month before. So the, the accuracy, again, apples to apples comparisons, not just one, you know, and 100 years later, there's another. Uh, another is that scribes would have to verbalize aloud while they were writing, right? So you have somebody else, others in the room, two or more, that as a scribe was writing and they were reading off the, 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 the parchments that they were actually copying, they were reading it aloud as they were writing it. So again, for accuracy, right? Every time they, listen, every time they, also in addition, right? This is funny, but it's true. Uh, historically, they, we know that they had to wipe the pen and wash their entire bodies before writing the word Jehovah every time they wrote it. Right? So it was, again, you say, well, what's that got to do with the accuracy of the copies? I'm just telling you, they were meticulously paying attention to every word, right? Uh, there was a review. Historically, there was a review from a scribe review every 30 days if they were writing Holy Scripture. So that every 30 days, listen, if as many as three pages required a single note of correction of any kind, the manuscript had to be destroyed and redone, right? Destroyed and redone with as many as three clerical notable errors, right? The letters, the words, the paragraphs had to all be counted on each page, right? The, or the document would be invalid. If two letters touched together, the docu document was considered invalid. The middle paragraph and the, and the middle words, so to speak, in the, in the writing had to correspond with the original document they were taking it from. I, I need you to understand, this was not a, a gentle exercise or a casual exercise. This was serious. And again, because this was the nature and the level of the, of, the, of the perfection they set out to do in making these copies because it wasn't just Jewish history they were recording, it was God's reveal, right? And they understood that. And lastly, before we go any past the copying, the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the greatest archeological finds of our day, still to this day, dates back to like 200 BC. And I would tell you that every time in my lifetime this happens, every time we find new, there's new digs or there's report of new digs, new archeological finds, man, the, the, the left, the, the <laughs> the atheists, the agnostics, they all go crazy because they're sure they're going to find something dated further back. And when they finally say, hey, here's one that's further back, they're sure that's going to discredit the Bible. That's going to somehow prove the Bible's wrong in some measure. And every time it's happened like three or four times in my lifetime already. And every time it does, we have this big blast. Get ready. This is going to mess up all of the Christian world because we found something older than even what they took the King James from. And then every time it comes out, it goes to the back page. Turns out, turns out. It not only didn't discredit or disprove, but actually further validated, further authenticated what we already have, right? Every time. So proof number two, right? That was proof number one. Proof number two is not only external evidence, but internal evidence, right? Internal evidence. The Bible was penned by 40 different human authors. Some say more. 40 different human authors spanning over 1,500 years, 
over 1500 years, literally spanning three continents from Babylon to Rome, uh, written from the wilderness, a prison cell, a palace, a lonely island, a dungeon, a battlefield, and, and other places as well. Authors included kings, fishermen, priests, government officials, farmers, shepherds, doctors, tent makers, pastors, prophets, peasants, and more, right? 66 different books comprise this Bible. They include law, history, poetry, prophecy, biographies, and formal letters, right? Formal letters. All of this diversity, all of this diversity comes together as an incredible unit, right? An incredible unit, a common thread woven throughout all 66 books in full agreement, fully reliable, fully continuous, right? A continuous story of harmony. Every bit of it, right? Every bit of it. One story from the beginning to the end, the story of God, his creation, his incredible love, his incredible reach, his heart to restore, his image bearing mankind creation all through his son, right? And, and then his soon coming to make all things right. One more time, right? It's one story, one story. It's incredible, right? Listen, this unity is due, I believe, in fact, that though it was penned by 40 different writers, listen, and, and it spanned over 1,500 years, I'm gonna tell you it was ultimately one author right? One author. It was inspired by God himself. And it was God breathed, as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. All these authors, as, as it says in 2 Peter, right? All these authors didn't write their own stuff. Many of them wrote things they did not even understand. They just knew it was from God. They penned it, and then it later came true, right? So no human effort alone could have ever pulled this off. It would have been impossible outside of God. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21 says this, because of that experience, he says, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets, talking about the Old Testament. You must pay close attention, Peter says, to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, he says, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. So what he says, or from human initiative. No, no, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God, right? They spoke from God. Evidence proof number three, personal evidence, right? External, internal, and now personal. The Bible says it's alive and powerful, right? The Bible is the best-selling book of all time. Some of you are like, yeah, 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 but, but how many is that really? I mean, you can't really go by that. Listen, let me just put it this way. Over 100 million copies right now are sold every year of the Bible right now. Over 100 million per year. The next secular work, right? The next popular second, the most popular work out there might surprise you is Harry Potter's series of books, right? That's the most popular outside of the Bible. They have sold 500 million copies over the life of their series, which has been about 20 years, right? So 500 million, that's a lot but that's over 20 years, as opposed to the Bible, which sells over 100 million every year and climbing, right, and climbing. I hope that makes sense so you, so you understand, right? It was the very first book ever printed off the first printing press, translated in well over 1,300 languages and climbing. Uh, millions upon millions of people, men and women and children, have been ir just undeniably transformed, right? undeniably transformed and, and become different people to the glory of God, right? In Christ likeness over the course of their life as a result of this book, as a result of this book. You say, no, that, that's not true. Um, you know, that may not, but there's other groups out there, radical Muslims, there's other people out there, their, their life is transformed too. Listen, I'm talking about being transformed in the likeness of Christ. Proof number four, last one, reference evidence. Reference evidence. Jesus said the Bible came from God, right? Historians, non-believer historians, Jews, Christians, Romans, have never made a single verifiable claim that Jesus ever said anything that wasn't absolutely 100% true. He was notorious and, and it's documented, well documented. Even people that hated him, even people that killed him, never never even, even could remotely prove that he ever said anything that wasn't true, right? So based on that, listen, he referenced the Old Testament scriptures too. And, and here's some quick examples, right? Matthew 22, Jesus references the Psalms, references David, right? And specifically, he quotes some from, from David. Uh, Matthew 22, also Jesus ties the scriptures with the power of God, just like it speaks in the Old Testament. Matthew 19, 4, he references Genesis and the act of creation. Again, validating, 100% validating that the, the creation story promotes us. Uh, Luke 11, it's the word of God, Jesus says. Luke 17, it's the reference of the Noah and the flood, right? Again, validating not just the, the, the chronological story, but validating the event and God's place in it with his creation. Mark 7, he calls the scripture again, the word of God. Matthew 24, he references Daniel and the, the Old Testament prophets as 
as God's people, as God's spokesmen inspired by God. Matthew 10, he references Sodom and Gomorrah, not as some fictional place, but as the real place that was really destroyed because of radical sin and rebellion against God. Matthew 12, he references Jonah and the whale. Hello, right? This is all referencing back, and again, Jesus being 100% noted for being 100% truthful, no lie ever came out of his mouth, and he's referencing the Old Testament as God's word, God's revealed through all these things. And again, referencing is validating when it comes from Christ, right? Almost done. The New Testament canon, right? We've talked about the Old Testament reference from the New Testament. The New Testament canon, when it was brought in, it had three criteria it had to meet, and hopefully this will help you. Number one criteria was the authority of the eyewitness apostle. So there was no, there was no writings, even in the New Testament era, right? There was no writings that were ever accepted and brought in as part of the canon that were not from an eyewitness apostle, right? So they had to have, had to be tied to, to, again, valid, not just somebody I saw something under a rock, had to be validated through eyewitness. Uh, the second one is teaching the truth aligned with the Old Testament and verified. So in other words, everything they put, everything they wrote, everything they felt inspired to write had to be validated, had to align with the Old Testament. It couldn't veer in any way or direction or it was completely set aside. And lastly, it had to be confirmed with the early New Testament church Again, the earliest ones, old as they might have been, were many of which were still eyewitnesses, right? So again, <laughs> this, is, this is in every way you can possibly look at what has been brought together as the canon of the Bible we have, has been validated and supported and substantiated as 100% authentic and it stands all by itself in all of the works of antiquity, all by itself. It's not like there's one or two or three made the top five. I'm talking about all by itself. There is nothing like it, right? Nothing like it. So that's it for this one. Uh, I hope this has been exciting to you. I, I promise you we get a little bit nerdy at the end. If this is something you're interested in, you want to watch episode three, right? You want to watch the final video, number three of three. This has been episode two. Thank you for being a part of this. Listen, if you found this valuable, and I, I know it's been long, but if you found it valuable and helpful in any way, I, I trust and pray that you will do us a favor. You'll partner with us in getting the word out. Uh, if you found it valuable, there's a good chance one somebody you know or care about will also. I want to encourage you to please share this video right? Share this video. And in addition, again, at no cost, go to our YouTube channel. There'll be a link in the description below. Go to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button down below the video and the little notification bell off to the side. If you will, if you'll do that for us, listen, in time, in time, the gospel will reach far, far, far beyond any of my contacts and far beyond any of yours, right? That's the truth. That's how it works. So I trust you'll do that. I trust you've enjoyed this one. Listen, uh, I'm looking forward to number three. I trust you will, you will be looking for it. And uh, until then, listen, on mission living is not for the elite and it's not for the few, it's for you. Lord bless you.